morning and welcome to the St. Luke's Lutheran Church in Obelisk online service for Sunday, August 7th, 2022. Wow, it's August already. My name is Dennis Faust. I will be your lay leader today. Uh, I will be getting an assist later on from someone else, uh, but a few brief announcements. This is a communion service, so please get your bread, cracker, wine, juice ready for that portion of the service. And for the special guest, we thank Barb Pence for helping us out with the communion part of the service. Uh, Pastor Pence is from Peace and Zion UCC down the street, our former sister congregation. Uh, we are open for in-person worship. This Sunday, we will have an 8 a.m. service here in the sanctuary with Pastor Cindy Cromus officiating the service. Uh, Pastor Cromus was here earlier this year, uh, so some of you may remember her, so please come on back. Uh, an update from the call committee. Uh, the call, call committee spoke with Pastor McKinstry uh, this past week. Uh, there are no candidates for us right now, but they hope some will be available after the next dean's meeting in August. And Pastor McKinstry, who is the dean of the Upper Montgomery Parish of the Southeastern Pennsylvania Synod, uh, he will be meeting with the call committee and church council uh, during council's August meeting. Uh, so as fall approaches, uh, the council also uh, is trying to take the pulse of the congregation as far as what they would like to see with fall worship services. Uh, there is a survey in the back of the, uh, in the narthex, and you should have received an email with that uh, survey as well. This deadline is Sunday, August 7th, so you still have time to get it in. Uh, back to council so that uh, your voice can be heard. So please do so. Uh, Vacation Bible School will be this coming week, August 8th through the 11th from 6 to 8 p.m. If you have children who uh, would like to attend or if uh, you would like to help, please reach out to Candace and uh, she can hook you up. The next community dinner is August 18th at 5.30 p.m. It remains takeout only, and the line forms early over outside the fellowship hall door. Uh, we hand out dinners until we run out. We make roughly 80 dinners. Uh, and as the line proceeds, we have a maximum of four per car. If you need more, we ask you to pull over and wait till we're done serving everyone in line, and we see if there's any left for, you know, and then we can go above four. This month's menu is a sloppy joe sandwich, baked beans, coleslaw, and a lemon pound cake for dessert. So hopefully we will see you in the line. Uh, if you've been in the sanctuary, you've noticed the pew racks are now filled with the Cranberry Hymnals, the ELW, Evangelical Lutheran Worship Books. Uh, however, if you'd still like to donate one, uh, you can absolutely do that. The cost is $25 per hymnal. All you do is write your check, put it in there with all the dedication information, put it in an offering plate, or mail it to the church, and uh, we will take care of that for you. Uh, also, the golf outing. So the St. Luke's golf outing will be September 9th. Uh, if you would like more information on that, uh, please reach out to Brendan Greer or uh, Rob Bickelman. Uh, they are heading that up and they can give you all the information you'd like. Uh, and then finally, during this time of pastoral transition, if you have a need for pastoral support, please reach out to Marty Jordan and he can get you hooked up with the resources that you need. With all that being said, let us begin with our order of confession and forgiveness. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God whose steadfast love endures forever. Amen. Let us confess our sin in the presence of God and of one another. Merciful God, we confess that we have not followed your path, but have chosen our own way. Instead of putting others before ourselves, we long to take the best seats at the table. When met by those in need, 
we have too often passed by on the other side. Set us again on the path of life. Save us from ourselves and free us to love our neighbors. Amen. Hear the good news. God does not deal with us according to our sins, but delights in granting pardon and mercy. In the name of Jesus Christ, your sins are forgiven. You are free to love as God loves. Amen. Sisters and brothers in Christ, beloved children of God, grace, mercy, and peace be with you all, and also with you. Let us pray. Almighty God, you sent your Holy Spirit to be the life and light of your church. Open our hearts to the riches of your grace, that we may be ready to receive you whenever you appear. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Our first reading is from Genesis chapter 15. After these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. Do not be afraid, Abram. I am your shield. Your reward shall be very great. But Abram said, O Lord God, what will you give me? For I continue childless, and the heir of my house is Elizer of Damascus. And Abram said, You have given me no offspring, and so a slave born in my house is to be my heir. But the word of the Lord came to him, This man shall not be your heir. No one but your very own issue shall be your heir. He brought him outside and said, Look toward heaven and count the stars if you are able to count them. Then he said to him, so shall your descendants be. And he believed the Lord and the Lord reckoned it to him as righteousness. Here ends our first reading. Our Psalm today is from Psalm 33. Happy is the nation whose God is the Lord. Happy the people chosen to be God's heritage. The Lord looks down from heaven and sees all humankind. God sits firmly enthroned and watches all who dwell on the earth. God fashions all their hearts and observes all their deeds. A king is not saved by the size of the army, nor are warriors rescued by their great strength. The horse gives vain hope for victory. Despite its great strength, it cannot save. Truly your eye is upon those who fear you, O Lord, upon those who wait for your steadfast love to deliver their lives from death and to keep them alive in time of famine. Our innermost being waits for you, O Lord, our helper and our shield. Surely our hearts rejoices in you, for in your holy name we put our trust. Let your loving kindness, O Lord, be upon us, even as we place our hope in you. Here ends our psalm. Our second reading is from Hebrews chapter 11. Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. Indeed, by faith our ancestors received approval. By faith, we understand that the worlds were prepared by the word of God, so that what is seen was made from things that are not visible. By faith, Abraham obeyed when he was called to set out for a place that he was to receive as an inheritance. And he set out, not knowing where he was going. By faith, he stayed for a time in the land he had been promised as in a foreign land, living in tents, as did Isaac and Jacob, who were heirs with him of the same promise. For he looked forward to the city that has foundations, whose architect and builder is God. By faith he received powers of procreation, even though he was old, and Sarah herself was barren, because he considered him faithful who had promised. Therefore, from one person, and this one as good as dead, descendants were born, as many as the stars of heaven, as the innumerable grains of sand by the seashore. 
All of these died in faith without having received the promise, but from a distance they saw and greeted them. They confessed that they were strangers and foreigners on this earth. For people who speak in this way make it clear that they are seeking a homeland. If they had been thinking of the land that they had left behind, they would have had opportunity to return. But as it is, they desire a better country, that is, a heavenly one. Therefore God is not ashamed to be called their God. Indeed, he has prepared a city for them. Here ends our second reading. The Holy Gospel reading is from the 12th chapter of St. Luke, beginning at the 32nd verse. Jesus said, Do not be afraid, little flock, for it is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Sell your possessions and give alms. Make purses for yourselves that do not wear out. An unfailing treasure in heaven, where no thief comes near and no moth destroys. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Be dressed for action and have your lamps lit. Be like those who are waiting for their master to return from the wedding banquet so that they may open the door for him as soon as he comes and knocks. Blessed are those slaves whom the master finds alert when he comes. Truly I say to you, he will fasten his belt and have them sit down to eat, and then he will come and serve them. If he comes during the middle of the night or near dawn and finds them so, blessed are those slaves. But know this, if the owner of the house had known what hour the thief was coming, he would not have let his house be broken into. You also must be ready, for the Son of Man is coming at an unexpected hour. The Gospel of the Lord. So our, our Sunday Gospel readings lately have been coming from the section of Luke that's typically known as the travel narrative, where Jesus has now set his sights on going to Jerusalem, and he spends about 10 chapters getting there. Jesus has a lot to say during those chapters, much of it unique to the Gospel of Luke. Those readings contain some of the best known phrases, the adages that would certainly make it into a Jesus book if he had written one. He could have called it helpful advice for busy Christians. And uh, a bunch of those adages are found in today's Gospel reading. The challenge, of course, is to understand these verses as more than just memorable words, worthy of plaques to hang up in your kitchen or in your office. What the key is, is to find the meaning of Jesus' quotable quotes. And, you know, do we only put them on church signs, or how do we apply them into our hearts? Well, typically, the way to find the deeper meaning is to find the reading in different contexts. The context that's probably most helpful for making sense of these verses is the literary, literary context. While the reading begins with, do not fear little flock, those words of encouragement might be better understood if you look at them as the conclusion of the previous portion of the story in Luke. Jesus had just pointed out that the lilies of the field grow because of God's care. He pointed out that the, that the ravens for which God provides. In other words, do not fear is not an out of the blue, optimistic pie in the sky statement. But it's something that comes out of the claim that God's faithfulness extends to the entirety of God's creation. Based on that, the opening verse makes a lot more sense. Jesus' opening statement wasn't hypothetical. 
He was standing in a place on the way to Jerusalem, thinking about what his disciples needed to hear. Not advice, not verses from the Bible to memorize or to be tested on later, not what would Jesus do Proverbs. He was leaving them with words that when heard again, when the disciples were sitting around what to do, wondering what to do rather, they might look up, uh, see something and say to each other, remember what Jesus said about this. And the words that they remember Jesus saying will not be just be words from way back when Jesus was around, but they will be words that continue to impress them, inspire them, uphold them, and will deeply matter to them. Does Jesus really intend for his disciples, the 12 back then, or for us nowadays, to give all they have away? How are we supposed to mentally process the urgency of those instructions to be alert 2,000 years later? It's no wonder Peter asks whether Jesus says these things to his disciples or, as he hoped, to everyone. Again, the reading today starts, Do not be afraid, little flock, for it is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Do not be afraid is almost one of the go-to phrases uh, from the Bible. And it occurs a multiple, a bunch of times in Luke's story about Jesus as well. It's a phrase that's used at least 70 times in the Bible. You may have noticed that it's also what God says to Abraham in today's first reading. Or Abram, I'm sorry. Typically, do not be afraid is what was said as a prelude to announcement of God's almighty and saving deeds. Here, it's the starting point, and it's the anchor for everything else in this passage. It is God's good pleasure. It's God's intention. It's God's plan, and it's God's delight to give you and I the kingdom. And since this is true, then the disciples can indeed res resist the seduction of wealth and not fall prey to the constant anxiety of worldly needs. They can share what they have with others, and they wait expectant expectantly, even eagerly, for the coming of the Son of Man. The point of the almsgiving, I think, is not to glorify poverty by circumstance or by choice, but rather to promote generosity as the mark of a Christian life. I don't know about you, but I've never really sold any of my possessions and given them as alms to the poor. I'm a little hesitant to empty my bank account and give everything to the church. Some biblical commentators approach this passage with some level of sophistication, apologizing for the reading's economic idealism from the start. And they said, Jesus certainly doesn't mean to sell all of one's possessions. He doesn't even use the word all. A little wealth does no harm, balance in all things. Well. That approach may miss the passages, the, this passage's urgency and dismisses a powerful learning opportunity for us today. There is a thief that steals and destroys, and there's a thief that saves. In the words of Alice McKenzie, a professor of preaching and worship at the Perkins School of Theology, God's holy thief is a burglar who returns to steal our false priorities and overturn our unstruck, unjust structures. When he breaks into our house, we will never be the same again. Jesus, with the wisdom of a patient teacher and looking to shepherd his flock, explains the key factor in discerning one thief from the other, fear. More than this, he tells his disciples and us today how this fear can be overcome. Sell your possession and give alms. But none of us have sold all that we have, and that, that's fine. When's the last time that you have lived unafraid, 
obedient to a God that ser who serves rather than an empire that destroys. Similarly, the watchfulness Jesus commands is not an anxious anticipation of the end of the world, but rather an eager expectation of God's consummation of history. What Jesus is commending is faith. Faith that frees everyone to be generous. Faith that enables us to leave anxiety behind. Faith that creates a confidence about a future secured not in human endeavor or achievement, but by God alone. But Jesus does not simply hold out faith as a model and a goal, much less as a standard by which to judge us. Rather, Jesus creates faith by announcing a promise, like a parent who loves their child deeply and desperately and wants all good things for them, so also it's God's good pleasure to give God's children the kingdom. These promises create a shared expectation about a future and bind together the giver and the receiver of the promise in that shared anticipation. Promises create relationship. Promises create hope. Promises create faith. All of our instruction about Christian life, whether about prayer, about money, about watchfulness, about care of our neighbors, and more, are therefore anchored in the gospel promise that, in, that is, indeed, God's good pleasure to give us the kingdom. Remembering, indeed, exalting in this promise enables us not only to have faith, but to answer Peter's question, is, just, is Jesus saying this to us or to everyone? And the answer to that question is, yes. Our identities shift during the reading of the passage as well. Sometimes we're frightened sheep, and then we're heirs of the kingdom. We're keepers of the treasure, and then we're slaves. We're the owners of the house, or we're the accomplices in the great heist that's going to happen. We could read part of this passage as if we were trying to keep the holy thief from plundering our possessions. But the command to be ready makes it sound like we're partners in this divine burglary. Maybe we're creating a disturbance in the kitchen as a distraction or we're opening the door when we hear a, a soft knock. It makes us sound as though we have a part to play in the Son of Man stealing back of creation. This all plays out in two pieces. The context of the first deals with wealth and possession. The context of the second is related to the vocation and what it means to live your life for God what it means to give yourself entirely to the purpose for which we have all been created. The second portion speaks to being ready for action and having your lamps lit. Jesus consoles his followers not to fear and follows with the promise of God's kingdom. And that's really where everything starts, isn't it? The certainty that God's favor, as it was revealed in the living, the dying, and the raising, and the ascension of Jesus. It's only after this promise that we can imagine any kind of concept of what our treasure, what that heavenly treasure might be. Given the choice of treasure first, we're likely to put our hope in achievements, acquisitions, and assets. Yet when the lack of fear kicks in, and overcomes our fear-driven desires for possessions, purchases, and procurements, then we might actually be able to imagine treasures well beyond self-driven determination, self-assessed success, and self-obsessed security. Being ready for Jesus' second coming is less about any actual time or place and more about imagining Jesus' activities in the world, when and where you least expect it or imagine seeing it. In other words, waiting around, waiting for instructions, 
That's not going to cut it. Fear, treasure, and being prepared is the pattern for discipleship. Being without fear, knowing the source of your treasure, that is, your identity, your worth, that makes it possible to be prepared for and to actually be a participant in God's kingdom. Being ready for Jesus' coming is less about any actual time and place and more about imagining Jesus' activity in the world when you least expect it or could imagine seeing it. The consistent message throughout the passage is not be ready so that you will avoid punishment, but rather be ready so that you will receive your blessing. It's a lot like keeping your house looking like a picture out of Better Homes and Gardens, because you never know when the realtor is going to show up to show your house to a prospective buyer. It's kind of, this kind of being prepared is less about being on high alert 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year, and more about focusing on the things of God while developing our peripheral vision in anticipation of being happily surprised when that time comes. When I was back in high school, I worked at a very nice restaurant. And in their kitchen, every tool, every ingredient was well within easy reach of the chef who was preparing the food. Everything had a place, and there was a place for everything. What was often overlooked was the army of prep cooks, dishwashers, and other staff, like me, who made sure that every tool, every ingredient, was within that chef's reach. Meals leave the kitchen with that kind of precision because the kitchen is prepared to anticipate every guest's order. The room hums with activity. The kitchen was always very busy. Maybe you've seen the joke, Jesus is coming soon, look busy. But looking busy isn't enough. Our waiting is actually an active participation in the kingdom. So be prepared for his coming with all the spiritual tools and ingredients that you'll need within easy reach and your garment tucked into your belt so you're ready to go to work. Then look out the window and see who Jesus sees. Be prepared. The kingdom of God is at hand. And stop being afraid. Amen. And if we would all join together with the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Trusting in God's extraordinary love, let us come near to the Holy One in prayer. Let your loving kindness be upon your church. Fill all who proclaim the gospel with your spirit. Equip your flock to speak your word of promise and hope in the midst of fear and uncertainty. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Let your loving kindness be upon your creation. Dwell among us and sustain our earthly home. In places of famine, provide nourishment. In places of plenty, fashion us to be good stewards of your bounty. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Let your loving kindness be upon your world. 
Be our helper and our shield in places of torn by strife and violence, especially the war in Ukraine. Raise up courageous leaders to govern with compassion and justice. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Let your loving kindness be upon your children. Look upon all who wait for your steadfast love. Console those who grieve and embrace those who cry out to you. Help us to trust your promise and to not be afraid. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Let your loving kindness be upon this community. Fashion our hearts to strive for the way of peace. Strengthen the outreach ministries of this congregation, particularly the community meal and our work with Daily Bread Food Pantry, and all who care for those in need. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. With thanksgiving, we remember all who have died in faith and now rest in you. As they place their hope in you, so strengthen us to trust in your promise of new life. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Receive the prayers of your children, merciful God, and hold us forever in your steadfast love. Through Jesus Christ, our holy wisdom. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always, and also with you. Share the peace with those around you and with all that you meet during this week. And before I pray our offering prayer, I would like to thank everyone who continues to send in their offerings to St. Luke's and helps provide support for the ministry here that we do. Thank you very much. God of abundance, you have set before us a plentiful harvest. As we feast on your goodness, strengthen us to labor in your field and equip us to bear fruit for the good of all. In the name of Jesus, amen. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread and gave thanks. He broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup. He gave thanks and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of of me. For as often as we eat this bread and drink from this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Let us pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. God of peace, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, bless you comfort you, and show you the path of life, this day and always. Amen.
Go in peace. Love your neighbor. Thanks be to God.